Welcome to There's No Clause for That, or is there? I'm Tyra Warner, and I'm your presenter for this session. Um, I'm a, an attorney in the United States and also a professor at the College of Coastal Georgia uh, and the department chair for um, hospitality, tourism, and culinary arts at the College of Coastal Georgia. I wouldn't be a lawyer worth my salt if I didn't start our presentation off with a disclaimer and some caveats. Um, and that is that the information that I'm providing here is only for educational purposes. Although I am an attorney, I'm only trained in US law, although we're a global audience here. So I'm gonna provide uh, information about legal and contracting issues on a general basis. But of course, if you're entering into contracts or you're looking for legal advice, you should seek out legal counsel in your own country. Um, and especially with regards to any specific contract needs that you have. Um, nothing that I'm going to say here should be construed as legal advice. No privilege attaches to anything we're talking about um, or anything that we communicate. So in other words, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer, so you can't sue me for malpractice. All right, moving on. I'd like to go ahead and start out this presentation by talking about uh, the elephant in the room, as we say colloquially, meaning the big issue that is on everybody's mind, the thing I'm hearing about the most in terms of contracts, and that is COVID-19 and how it's affected contracts, uh, those that we have already had signed um, and those that we have coming up uh, still and future meetings and events um, and, and all of the contracts that have to go with those. I think that's probably top of mind for everybody and although not the biggest contract uh, issue that we'll have ever, it's certainly the one that seems to be top of mind for right now. So I think it makes a good basis for talking about contract issues. Um, so let's get started on that. Um, but I welcome contract questions um, on any topic. So we know that COVID-19 um, has been in the news. Um, it's, in fact, it seems to be all we've read about um, anywhere. Um, and and I, you know, starting as early as early February, uh, I started seeing in the trade press about how many conferences, trade shows, expos, exhibitions were being um, either delayed or postponed or canceled due to, uh, at that time we were saying coronavirus, now we're saying COVID-19. Um, but, you know, a lot of things they talked about first in Asia. Uh, and, you know, this was an article about China uh, where it started and things that were happening. Um, and then, of course, um, in Barcelona, uh, there were there was talk, you know, and if you if you look at the date here, this is 10 February, where the Mobile World Congress was still talking about, well, we're we're still going to go on, but we're going to have to put some additional safeguards in place. Um, and the dates here are important because if you remember, um, and it seems like ages ago in some ways, um, you know, we were as things were unfolding with COVID-19, as we were all coming to grips with the reality. Um, the reality of what was going to happen to our meetings and our events and our venues and our vendor contracts and our businesses um, was all unfolding too. And that becomes very pivotal in deciding what you're going to do with your contracts and who's going to honor what. So, you know, at first what I heard uh, from a lot of meetings, um, you know, from, from everybody was, uh, you know, well, we may just have to postpone it a little while. Um, and that's a that's sort of a different contract issue from some of the things that that happened later. So, for example, uh, if you're postponing a contract, um, a lot of times you're not even kicking in a real contract clause at all. Uh, a lot of times this is done on a handshake basis, um, but you still want to make sure you put any kind of postponements in writing. And I don't just mean an email. Um, as we've probably seen now from February until now that we're well into May, um, you know, people have that were at, um, at, at vendors offices, at venue offices, um, may not be at those jobs anymore. So any agreements that we made, uh, those people may be gone now. So there may not be continuity of information. So if you're going to postpone something, put it in writing, execute a new contract, or at least an addendum to attach to that contract so that all of the terms 
are spelled out for the postponement. The new dates, the new space, the new rates, the new services, um, whether there's going to be an addition uh, of fees or if the fees are going to be the same. Are we moving it to a high season, a low season? Um, are we going to change the, the food and beverage or the service charges? Anything like that. Leave no stone unturned. Make sure all of the terms are very, very clear because honestly, you may be dealing with new people you may be dealing really with a whole new company. A vendor that you may have signed a contract with may have had to assign your contract to somebody they had to sell the business to. Um, you know, we're, we're really in dire straits for some of us um, over COVID-19, especially smaller businesses. Um, so execute a new contract. If there's any kind of fee to be paid for postponement, so if it's not just a straight, hey, let's pick new dates, uh, make sure that's clear how much, when it's supposed to be paid, what currency it's going to be paid in, um, you know, what the repercussions are. If it doesn't get paid, does that mean you're in default? Does that mean the services aren't going to be rendered? Um, the meeting doesn't go on exactly what? Um, and then, of course, if it's something that you need to address with your attendees as well, the postponement, um, what does that mean? If they've already paid registration fees, uh, booth fees, um, if they have already booked airfare, uh, if they can't come on the new dates, what does that mean? Do they get to, if they cancel, do they get everything back? Do they apply it to the next year? Um, so you've got to, to decide on all of that. And then, of course, program changes. Um, if, if speakers can't make it for the new dates and that kind of thing, you've got to address that. So postponement comes with a whole host of issues of its own, most of them not contractual, honestly, because there is no, generally, there's not a postponement clause um, in contracts, although some of you may be astute enough uh, to have one in there, but it's not one I see routinely um, in contracts. Um, some of you know that uh, Meeting Professionals International World Education Congress um, did in fact decide to postpone uh, its meeting. So it's a very good example of uh, a large meeting with um, a global attendance that decided to postpone uh, from June to November, which is a, a big postponement, uh, with a different arrival departure pattern. Um, and so they've got to look at their program and their speakers um, and, you know, and of course, we don't know what will happen with COVID-19 um, and what will be happening in November, uh, how many people will be willing to travel, how many people will be willing to meet, um, and what that might mean to attendance numbers. So that's where we get back to kind of looking at our content. And as we know too, uh, going back to the Mobile World Congress, that ultimately, although on 10 February, they had said they were gonna just put some additional safeguards in place, um, they made our ec an excellent first case study because in fact, on 13 February, the news came out that they were gonna be, they were going to cancel. Um, and, and I'm not throwing them under, under the bus, just that they were one of the first um, global meetings, uh, global expos that we, we read about that was going to uh, cancel. And at the time, if you can think back that far, it was, uh, it sort of shook the news in our industry because it was like, hey, it's not in Barcelona, COVID-19 is not there. What are they thinking? What's going on? Um, and of course now it was obviously a prudent choice. Um, and so people have, have had time to think about that. But from a legal perspective, the big issue that came out, um, not for the, just for them, but for so many organizations is, if we decide not to hold our meeting, is it a cancellation or is it a termination or an excuse of performance um, for those uh, entities, those countries, those contracts that have a force majeure clause or a termination or an excuse of performance, whatever label, impossibility, whatever label they've got on that clause. Um, is, it, is it something that is a voluntary, we want to cancel, we decided not to hold our meeting, we're going to pay damages to the venue, we understand, or to the vendor, whoever you're canceling with, um, that's cancellation. You know, we've just decided we choose not to honor this contract. Uh, we're going to use this clause. It's not a default. We've, cho we've decided we're not going to use your services. We've decided we're going to exercise this clause, this cancellation clause, and, and we're going to exercise it. We're going to pay the damages that are required. We're not going to go forward with this, period. Um, we pay the damages, and that's that. Um, force majeure is when you've got a supervening or an intervening event beyond the control of the parties, 
that prevents the party from um, performing the contract. And this is where the big question has come in with COVID-19, right? Because it's been, you know, in February, did COVID-19 really prevent people from holding meetings or was it just fear of COVID-19? Because fear is not a force majeure. Um, but when, when countries and later cities started saying, you know, putting a government mandate down and saying, you may not have public gatherings greater than X number of people, well, that became a government regulation that did fall within most force majeure clauses. So it became very much a fine line of when is it a force majeure and when is it not? Because if it was a force majeure, then the contract terminates, it self-destructs, and everybody goes away, no damages are paid, and if there's insurance, event cancellation insurance, business interruption insurance, um, it, even for, for venues or vendors, then it may pay in those circumstances. It doesn't pay if there's just a cancellation. So this became a really big issue in terms of COVID-19 and continues to be. Is it illegal, impossible, or, or depending on how your force majeure clause is written, commercially impracticable to hold your meeting, or are you just choosing? Um, and we're going to see this going forward. And of course, it's not just a COVID-19 issue. Um, for example, this is a real scenario that happened a few years ago. Um, there was a uh, speedway, one of those where you could uh, you can r drive a Lamborghini or a Ferrari or something around a speed track with an expert driver. Um, and um, a group had an incentive program there. Uh, in fact, it was a, a, a third party that had two incentive groups booked to 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 enjoy this. Um, and before they were a month before they these two groups were supposed to be there, there was a wreck at the track and two people died. Um, so the two groups said, hey, third party, we don't we don't want to come. We don't want to use that. It seems unsafe suddenly, as though driving Lamborghinis and Ferraris around a track at high speeds is not already unsafe. Um, and they didn't want to come. And so the question became, is it is it a cancellation or is it a force majeure? Well, you know, while the track was closed for investigation of an industrial accident, which it was, it was clearly a force majeure. You can't do the program if the track is closed. But once they were actually exonerated of any wrongdoing, turns out the driver had a heart attack and there was nothing anybody could do. It was purely an accident. Then there's no force majeure. The track was exonerated of any wrongdoing. Um, so then it would have become a cancellation. Now, the track was willing to forgive and, and forget if the group decided they didn't want to do it. And that's the way a lot of things are done in our industry. Um, but it would have been a cancellation if the group had decided not to come. As it was, one group went through with it, one chose not to. A lot of other groups did decide to cancel um, because of force majeure, I mean, because of COVID-19. And I expect there will be a lot of disputes about cancellation versus force majeure. Um, these are just a couple of groups um, that I read articles about that, that did decide to cancel. I know there are hundreds, maybe thousands of canceled contracts that, that probably will be in dispute. Um, and and it will be a lot of it, a lot of them will be facing that inquiry. Um, there will be a lot of handshake deals made because hotels are going to need the business going forward. Uh, hotels, convention centers, expo halls, vendors. Um, I hope we'll all do a lot of business and not worry about the legalities. But I know there will be a lot of disputes to be resolved as well. Um, you know, there are other legal doctrine um, in the U.S. as well as in other countries, certainly, that could kick in um, on these kinds of situations. For example, in the U.S., there are a couple of other doctrines called the Frustration of Purpose Doctrine, which says that the event that interfered with the contract is wholly unforeseeable and renders the contract, contract valueless to the party, then the contract can self-destruct. Or the doctrine of impossibility excuses a party's non-performance um, if it becomes objectively impossible. But remember, these are high standards and, and are construed very, very strictly. 
So you have to, to really watch those carefully. And again, in, in other countries, there may be similar doctrine. So you have to confer with uh, counsel in the, in the country or the province or the state where your meeting is being held or where you're located, depending on the law governing your contract. So that's something you also wanna look at in your contract is what law governs the interpretation of your contract. Is it where the meeting is being held? Is it where you are? Or is it where the other party is? So there should be a governing law provision in there. So sometimes we decide that even though things are not quite right, we still have to hold our meeting. We still have to get the services that we contracted for, even if circumstances aren't um, and we are seeing that with uh, COVID-19, but also sometimes, for example, I had a group once um, that had, a, because of the nature of their contract, um, there was a hurricane headed toward Florida, and the city that they were supposed to hold their meeting in was in the cone uh, where the hur hurricane was supposed to hit, but they still, um, because the venue said, one of the venues said, we're not sure if the hurricane's coming here, so you need to still come in and set up for your exhibition or we're going to claim cancellation. Um, and so the group said, well, we think it is going to come. We don't want to come. We want to claim force majeure. And the venue said, if you don't come, we're going to claim cancellation or anticipatory breach of contract. Um, and so they were kind of in a pinch. Now, what I thought was interesting in this situation was that one of the venues, one of the hotels that they had, had some great language um, that I think is really interesting. Um, and it was this language that basically said, uh, if a force majeure or similar, similar event occurred, that if they didn't cancel the meeting and went forward with it, that performance and attrition provisions would be waived. Now, that's not something that happens automatically, but I thought it was great uh, forethought for somebody to put that language in the contract. Now, I still wouldn't want to hold a meeting somewhere where a hurricane was happening, but there could be circumstances, and I think something like this could fit very well with the COVID-19 scenario, where if people, if your numbers are down and people don't come or your numbers are just not as big, more people choose the virtual side than the face-to-face -face side, it might be nice to have language something like this that says either you get greater uh, slippage or you don't have to pay as much attrition or something like that. Um, so that may be something to consider going forward. Not that I think hotels are just going to say, hey, do your best and, and bring as many people as you can. We're not back in the early 80s uh, anymore. But um, you may want to consider having some type of negotiation strategy like that. If you are going to be renegotiating contracts for future meetings, maybe those that have gotten canceled, um, remember that although we in the travel industry are very optimistic about travel in the future, not everybody is. Um, we don't know about our attendees yet. So you may want to you know, keep an ear to them and recognize that not everybody's ready to hop on planes and be in crowded ballrooms and exhibition halls. So um, do be conservative maybe with your numbers. Um, you might want to think about whether you need to include in contracts things like specifying health, safety, and cleaning standards. Um, the American Hotel and Lodging Association, for example, just came out with uh, cleaning and safety standards for hotels uh, in the U.S., so it gives a basis. Um, I know some uh, the Wynn in Las Vegas came out with a 23-page um, standard for their hotel for what they're going to do in terms of cleanliness and, and safety. Um, so making sure you have an idea of what the hotels are going to do to keep keep people safe uh, and clean, keep the place clean. Um, you know, if we are still practicing social distancing, uh, does that mean we're going to have maybe lower numbers, meaning we're going to have uh, smaller room blocks and less food and beverage, but we need more space? And what does that look like in a hotel contract? That's what uh, back in the old days when I was first a meeting planner, we called an ugly baby um, because we needed a lot of space and we didn't need a lot of services. So does that mean room rental goes up? Does that mean we've got additional fees in, uh, for, uh, for services? Because that doesn't help the hotel to sell things um, on an even basis. Um, and then think about your dispute resolution methods. 
Um, is now the time that you want to have that discussion with your organization about do we want to use mandatory arbitration to resolve disputes rather than litigation? Um, I can say this because I don't litigate, but you know, litigation really only the lawyers win. Um, you know, arbitration is is quicker and less expensive, um, but it doesn't always resolve in a in a big winner and a, a big loser. A lot of times, you get a sort of a split decision where nobody walks away super happy. It's a conversation you should have within your organization um, uh, how you might want to resolve. Just the last issue I just wanted to mention that kind of goes along with all of this is event cancellation insurance. If you are not an organization that has typically gotten this, you may want to relook at it. Um, if you have gotten it in the past, you recognize that it's a business interruption insurance. So it covers not only um, having to cancel a meeting due to a circumstance beyond your control, a force majeure type event, um, but also if you uh, sort of a partial force majeure, if a circumstance beyond your control results in lower attendance, um, if your meeting is is uh, short, it starts late, it ends early, uh, and resulting in a sort of a partial force majeure. Um, but also sometimes if a circumstance means that you can't, your meeting is interrupted, uh, for example, it has paid for a tarp across a, a roof that caved in due to snow. Um, so things like that. But you should recognize that um, things like infectious and communicable disease were probably exclusions from most event cancellation insurance policies already. Um, and for sure, going forward, you're going to find that once something like this happens, a COVID-19, it becomes an exclusion. Um, so they may come forward and start offering a rider for this, but it will not be inexpensive. So if you're looking to get it to cover COVID-19, talk to your insurance provider. Don't assume it's included um, and understand that it will only be included um, if, if there's a force majeure type event and only if you have special coverage for it probably. And that probably the same is true for travel insurance. I've seen travel insurance claims denied for COVID-19 already. Um, so just keep that in mind. Talk to your insurance um, person before you assume there's coverage. So that is all the presentation I have for you, but I do welcome any questions that you might have. And thank you so much for letting me present for you. Wow, Tyra, that was simply incredible. I can see from the chat, as I'm sure you all can, there are hundreds, literally, questions that we've got. We've got nearly 400 people here in the room. Tyra is doing her very best to answer those questions. Tyra, I hope you're still breathing. <laughs> I am doing my very best. I think in response to a lot of the questions that we've got, you know, you've done an amazing job. Thank you for doing that whilst we're live and on time. And I know we haven't got a huge amount of time, but I have a couple of questions that um, I'd like to ask whilst we've got a couple of minutes. And perhaps people can connect in directly if they've got a specific question for you, because we will run out of time, sadly. Um, the recording of the session, I believe and I understand, will be on Planet IMEX at some point after we finish all of this activity. But in the future, what new contract clauses do you see? Everybody's, everybody wants your crystal ball. What do you see being put in place, Tyra? Sure. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. A lot of times we lawyers say there's there's nothing new under the sun. Um, and, I, and I think that's true in this case, too. I don't know that there will be so much new as I think we will be looking at the clauses that we already have differently. Um, you know, I think we're all taking apart our force majeure clause and we're looking at that um, and, and trying to see what, how we need to change that. Um, so I think that's a big one. You know, a lot of people ask the question about commercially impracticable, um, and that's, that's not a typo or a stutter. Um, it is impracticable, um, you know, and, and what that looks like. And, and again, this is something that's well established in U.S. law, but if you're in another country, it's something you may want to explore to see if that's applicable in other countries. Um, and it is, a, it is a wiggle word, you know. It definitely is one of those that basically means it doesn't make good business sense um, you know, to, to hold the meeting or for the, the, the venue to host the meeting or for the, you know, supplier to provide the services. 
Um, but so often that's the, that's the case. Very rarely is it illegal to hold the meeting or to host the meeting or, or impossible. Um, so, you know, that's, that's something that we'll be looking at. Um, you know, I think the, one of the clauses that I do think we're going to see in the immediate future is we're going to see standards for cleaning, um, standards for social distancing, um, and what our expectations are of suppliers, of venues, um, but also for uh, meeting organizers, you know, that, that hotels and venues are going to expect uh, meetings to be held a certain way. So I think we're going to see some standards in that respect. Um, and then again, some of the usual clauses, um, indemnification, and what happens if, if somebody does fall sick, um, you know, that kind of thing. I think people are real worried about liability if somebody gets sick at a meeting, um, but that's just going to rise to our usual duty of care uh, inquiry as, it, as anything would if anybody got injured in any way. Before we go, I'm going to ask you, this is a new thing, just to have a run through the chat, Tyra. Is there anything particular in terms of the questions that we've got here that you'd like to read or pick up on or address? Because I know that the chat was going absolutely crazy in terms of the questions that people had for you. Is there anything there that you wanted to either highlight that you've already answered or a question that you think you could answer before sure. we close the session? Sure, there were some great ones. Um, and I see that somebody did mention um, that, and this is something that I had mentioned in another webinar, that um, the American Hotel and Lodging Association did come up with, they have a stay safe uh, advisory council that came up with some cleaning standards for hotels. Um, and that's a nice neutral thing to tie a contract clause to regarding how hotels will be cleaned. Um, and somebody did mention that on the chat. So that's a good standard to mention. Um, you know, I think people are very concerned about postponement or, or cancellation and rebooking and what the expectation is. And I guess the one big thing is when you open up a contract for any reason and then rebook or um, that kind of thing, you know, just remember anytime you open up a contract, you're opening up all the terms. Um, and so certainly a vendor or a venue or a speaker or anybody, if you've opened up that contract, may come back with additional terms. Um, and so that's something that you're just subject to renegotiating. Um, and you've just got to kind of figure it out. I think the other thing that I'm seeing that I saw from several people, you know, was people are sort of hesitant to cancel future meetings, kind of waiting to see if they're going to be a force majeure situation or whether it's going to be a cancellation. And you can't blame them if it's force majeure there'll be no, you know, it'll be a termination without liability. If it's cancellation, they're going to have to pay maybe many thousands in cancellation. There's really no way to force that hand. Um, and you can understand the reasons for it. And I guess the, the, the non-lawyer thing I would say is let's just remember this is a relationship business and we're kind of all in it together. I think that is an absolutely wonderful ending of a session that I'm sure that all our participants would agree. We'd like to keep you for another two hours at least. Ask you all